Okay. So there's a few questions to answer. Um, the first one is, can one thing be more than one type of dukkha? Okay. So if we look at the three types of dukkha, the dukkha of pain, the dukkha of change, and the pervasive dukkha of conditionality, yes, something can be um, all three of those. So we haven't gotten so much into the dukkha of uh, pervasive, the pervasive dukkha of conditionality. We will in this session. But briefly, what that refers to is taking the five aggregates, the body and mind that we have, under the influence of ignorance, afflictions, and karma. Okay, So that sets the basis for everything else. Because once we have a body like this that experiences pain, okay, we're set up for the dukkha, the, uh, you know, of pain. When we have the mental aggregates that, uh, you know, and influenced by karma, where we are picky, we complain, we like, we don't like what we, we want, what we want when we want it. Okay. All of that is, comes up on the basis of just having taken a body and mind that are not free of afflictions and karma. Okay? Because we have a mind that very easily becomes upset or very easily becomes greedy. Don't we? Yeah? We have a body that easily becomes sick or painful in one way or another. So on this basis of just having the body in mind, which is the third kind of dukkha, okay, then when we experience some sense objects, the immediate feeling we have with them is pleasure. Okay? But, again, because this is all under the influence of afflictions and karma, yeah, that pleasant feeling doesn't always last because the body, you know, is changing, the mind is changing, and so very easily then, uh, you know, what started out as pleasure became painful. So it started out, you know, as pleasurable, which is the dukkha of change, and then as the more we do it, the more it changes into something that is unpleasant, which is the, the dukkha of pain. Okay? So these three kinds of dukkha are very interrelated. They're not separate things, yeah? And they all are on the basis of having been born in samsara. That's the big problem, okay? So it's not a question of tweaking our samsara, yeah, to try and make it better, because the whole thing by its own nature is, you know, in unsatisfactory, okay? So this is, is something that is hard for us to understand, because our whole life has been oriented to seeking sense pleasure, and staying away from pain. And so we see kind of like the purpose of our life as securing pleasure, securing security, securing what we want, but, you know, and, and never doing it well enough so that unpleasant feelings never arise. But under the influence of karma, circumstances change, and also because our aggregates are under the influence of afflictions and karma, they are not stable. And so what we like at one moment, we find obnoxious later on. Okay? Are, are you moody? 
Yeah. Are you sometimes, you know, have you, have you encountered people who you know them well, but you're never quite sure who they're going to be that time you talk to them? Cause some days they are in great moods and some days you call them to say hi and they're like, Oh, the world is rotten. And you never quite know what you're going to greet when you, you know, contact that person. Can you think of somebody like that in your life? Yeah. Now, I know none of you are like that. Yeah. You're always stable, well-balanced, yeah, predictable. You never, you know, are moody or anything like that. So we're talking about all those other people. Okay. But you'll see with all those other people, yeah, it, it's, it's a roller coaster. Yeah. And if we feel that greeting them, we're never going to, we're never sure what part of the roller coaster the ride they're going to be on. Imagine how it feels to be them when they swing from one extreme to the next unpredictably. And, yeah, and how sometimes maybe, maybe that happens to us too. Yeah, you might be able to find some instances when your mind has not been so uh, even and balanced. Yeah, just, just, I'm just putting that out there just to think about because we all know it's those other people. Okay, but this is, you know, how the three types of dukkha are related. Yeah. Could you please elaborate on how to lessen attachment without becoming indifferent, careless, or careless for the object or person? Okay, so attachment is based on exaggerating the good qualities of someone or something, and then we stick to it. We want it, we want to possess it, we don't want to be separated from it. Okay. Now, you know, remember I just briefly mentioned that mental factor of confusion, you know? So this is a good example of confusion. When we think of releasing that unrealistic attachment, because it is unrealistic, we, we've exaggerated good qualities, then we immediately flop to, I don't care. Okay? I don't care. I'm not attached. Do what you want. I don't care. Doesn't matter to me. Go to hell if you want to. You know, go get drunk and shoot drugs. I don't care. I am not attached to you at all. Okay. Do you think that that is a virtuous mental state that the Buddha would encourage us to have? I don't think so. Okay. So when we, in our confusion, think that the that when we detach from an object, we go to that mental state, then we haven't understood properly. Okay. So a really good test of, you know, whether you've understood something properly or not is to ask if the conclusion you draw is something virtuous that the Buddha would have to teach you because you can't get to that mental state yourself. But I think we can all ourselves get to the mental state of total apathy. I don't care. I give up on you. Okay. We don't need to learn that from the Buddha. Our afflictions are impressed and uh, do that. Okay. So what we're trying to get to is a state where we can appreciate the qualities that someone or something has without exaggerating them and without clinging to them and thinking that we 
definitely need them in order to be happy. That our happiness depends on that object. Okay, so we can enjoy someone or something when it's there, and when it's not there, we're okay because we haven't exaggerated its importance in our life by thinking, you know, it's the one thing that I have to have. Otherwise, my life is, you know, a disaster. Okay? So this, this detachment, this more balanced mind that is open and tolerant, yeah, without exaggeration, that mind can enjoy being with all sorts of different people. When we have attachment, there's someone who's the one and only person. Or maybe we have a few different people in our circle of the people who we can be happy with. And other people are either, we don't want to be around them, or we're indifferent to them. Okay, so when we have our, when our mental structure is like that, then we limit our happiness because I can only be happy when I'm around this and this and this person. Okay, that's quite limiting, isn't it? Because we're attached, we've exaggerated, we want to possess them, never be separated from them. When we don't have that, then we're much more open and receptive and we're curious about other people. How does this person think? What is their life experience? Okay, the same thing with objects. Yeah, when you have something that works, that's great. You enjoy it. When it breaks, you don't go in, you don't have a fit. Okay, so you stop computer hell. It's like, because, how do you stop computer hell? Because you know at the very beginning, when you get your computer, that sometime or another, it's not going to work properly. And you know that it will always happen at the time when you're in a hurry, when you have something important to do. Okay, so you already know that. So then when it happens, it's not a shock. Okay, so it's like uh, looking at a, uh, a ceramic glass or a ceramic cup, and instead of, you know, oh, this is so beautiful and it's painted so lovely and... I have it, which means I'm an important person. These people value me because they give me this painted cup that's so gorgeous, that's better than everybody else's cup. You know, when you look at that cup, you say, this cup is already broken. Of course, it's not broken yet. But in your mind, you say, it's already broken. So there's nothing here to get attached to. Nothing here to get proud of having. Okay? And then when it's break, broke, broke, when it breaks, you can say, I told me so. (laughs) Yeah? Because you knew beforehand. Okay? So the way to reduce attachment is... One technique is to think about the impermanence of the person or the object or the relationship, how everything is changing moment by moment, never remaining the same. And that as soon as two things come together, they have to separate. Staying together forever is impossible. So Queen Elizabeth is experiencing this right now. She's been married how many years? 70-something years to Prince Philip, and he just died. Imagine what she's going through because her life was so intertwined with his. 
that she, you know, he, he was almost like a part of her. And now that's gone. Okay. And there was the idea, you know, she said at one point, he's my strength or some, something like that. Yeah. Uh, but every, everything that comes together has to separate. So it's good if we think about that from the very beginning. Yeah. This person that I'm close to now, okay, they're going to die or I'm going to die. We don't know who's going to die first. Okay. And before we die, some other circumstance may happen whereby we're separated. Okay. People can be separated by floods and national, natural disasters, by war, okay, by a wall. There's lots of ways, yeah, but the more attached, the more we suffer. Now the question comes up, but what about children's attachment to their parents? Yeah. Here, this kind of attachment is different because children, in order to be well-balanced, have to form a close relationship with somebody. It doesn't have to be their parent, but with somebody when they're little that they can rely on. Okay, it can be a grandparent or a babysitter or a friend or a sibling or whatever. That is part of a healthy psychological development for an infant. Okay. I know many, uh, many of my Tibetan friends, their mothers died when they were children, but they are perfectly well balanced adults. Okay. Because somebody else took over that role in their life. Yeah. So that kind of thing is a bit different. Mm -hmm. But somebody usually cares for a baby. <laughs> and that is proven by the fact that we are still alive. If nobody cared about us when we were little, we would have died. Okay, Sometimes it's hard for us to realize how people cared for us because we would have liked for them to care for us in a different way. As long as we hold on to that, I wish it were, yeah, there's pain in the mind when instead we can just look and say, you know, they did their best, and appreciate that, then we can make peace and feel uh, that connection with them. Because they did, in one way or another, imperfectly make sure we stayed alive. Yeah? Made sure we got an education. And when we think of their circumstances growing up, we might have some compassion for them too. Okay. But that, uh, yeah, we appreciate, but without the, the stickiness. Because the difficult, another thing with attachment, another antidote, the first one was thinking about attachment is thinking about the disadvantages of overestimating somebody's good qualities and how they will separate at one time or another. And, you know, look at your life. Yeah, have you ever suffered from separating from people you cared about? Yeah, friends that you had that were dear friends. Something happened and you've lost touch with them, or you had a big quarrel, or they kind of completely decided they didn't like you and you have no idea what happened. That happens a lot too. 
Okay. So if we think about the disadvantages of attachment, then that reminds us at the beginning not to exaggerate, not to think, oh, this is the one person who's going to fulfill all my needs. Okay. So a lot of people, I'm going off on a tangent, come to the Dharma, and our teachers are so kind, and they're so compassionate. And we project on them all this thing of they're going to be the one person who's going to love me unconditionally because I never had that unconditional love when I was a kid. Okay? We project that onto them. And then life goes on. And then your teacher does something you don't like. That doesn't mean your teacher was wrong. It doesn't mean they're trying to harm you. It means that you don't like something. It didn't meet your need. It didn't meet your expectation. They didn't do what you wanted, what you thought they should do. And then, you know, you experience this sense of loss. So we do this whole thing of projection on many different people in our life. And, um, you know, then when things don't work out as we would have liked them to work out, yeah, instead of realizing that what the Buddha told us is true, that everything comes together, so it it must part, yeah. So we, we, we need to avoid the clinging and the attachment but still have the caring for the people because they are a sentient being. Okay, for no other reason. We don't care for them because you give me presents, you praise me, you stick up for me when other people criticize me, you meet all my needs. When I want to laugh, you want you laugh with me. When I'm sad, you console me. You're everything I want you to be when I want you to be that. Instead of that being the reason why we care for somebody, which is attachment, we care for them because they're a sentient being just like us who wants to be happy and doesn't want to suffer and has been kind to us, not just in this life, but in many, 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 many previous lives. Okay, so that's a good antidote to that kind of attachment. But you have to really practice it. But I think the first step is look in your life and see, you know, where are the times where I've been upset or angry or disappointed? Yeah. And see how attachment played a role in that. Yeah, because then you can begin to see the faults of attachment. Mm -hmm. Okay, then the third question is, if uh, reflecting on dukkha makes us depressed and not sober, what's going on in the mind? Is this a wrong conclusion? Yes, it is a wrong conclusion. What is going on in the mind? We are following our own habitual emotional patterns, yeah, which our our emotional patterns are based on this thing of, you know, I should be happy all the time. Don't you think that? Maybe not always consciously, but isn't that thought somewhere in your mind? I should be happy all the time. Suffering should never happen to me. And I am entitled to happiness. Why? Because I'm me. And I just happen to be the most important person in the world, if you haven't learned that already. So I am entitled to happiness. I deserve happiness. In fact, the world owes it to me. 
Yeah. So these kind of thoughts are lurking around in our mind. This is what's called the self-centered mind. So when those thoughts don't get what they want, what happens? Yeah, we get depressed. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. Think I'll eat some worms. Remember that? We used to say that as kids. Yeah, these people, they, they loved me so much and now they be, betrayed me. Yeah, I had counted so much on this. I worked so hard on it and now it's not happening. COVID happened instead. You know, I finally got accepted to the college I want. I'm starting, you know, in the spring semester of 2020. Well, no, I'm not starting in the spring semester of 2020. Yeah. Or I'm starting, but I'm at home with everything that goes on at home. I don't get to live in the dorms and go to all the parties and meet new people, okay? So, I mean, this is, this is what life is, isn't it? Yeah? And so when, when our old pattern is, I, I don't get what I, I want or what I'm expecting or what I think I deserve, then, you know, either something's wrong with me or something's wrong with the world, or something's wrong with both me and the world. And I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't know what's wrong with the world. I don't know what's wrong with both of us. So I just feel depressed. I don't know what to do. There's no help around. There's no hope around. And we get depressed. Okay. I'm not here talking about the depression that comes from chemical imbalance in the mind. I'm talking about depression that comes from, you know, these kinds of things. Okay. So, yeah, we get stuck there. That's our habit. So then we either get angry at the world or we throw ourselves a pity party. But if we're smart, we adjust to the new situation. And so many people during COVID, they have not only adjusted, but what started out to be a really bad situation for them, they have been resilient and discovered all sorts of things and done all sorts of things that they never would have done before. Okay, they made new friends, they did volunteer work online, they reached out to their neighbor, they even talked to their neighbor, they talked to their children instead of commanding their children to do one thing or another. They actually talked to them, yeah. They got to know their spouse or their partner in a better way. Yeah, they took up some new line of interest. They began to think deeply about what is the meaning of life and what is my legacy and what do I want, what kind of person do I want to be when I die? When I die, what do I want to look back on and say with, say with satisfaction, my life was meaningful? So sometimes going through that very difficult situation, yeah, it can be a breakup or COVID or who knows what, yeah, it makes you think more deeply about something. Yeah, you got in a traffic accident. Yeah, that woke you up, didn't it? And it was like, oh, okay, you know, I can't count on my life being predictable for another you know, 100 years or whatever, I have to do what's important right now. Yeah. So in the face of uh, separation, we can really, uh, it can become a very important time in our life. Yeah. When we reassess what we're doing 
and then chart a different path and wind up uh, feeling more satisfied with our life than we did before when we were running around being the busiest of the busy and so frantic that we had no time to actually think for ourselves or get to know the people that we care about. Okay? So four, is there a way to keep in balance to avoid going to extremes, like uh, an extreme, like to become a loner? No friends, no TV, think we shouldn't have money, etc. when we live in a society. Okay, so I'm at this thing right now, so attached. So this is a, a similar question to, to the one of what happens if we go to depression. This person goes to, I am going to be the new renunciant. I am going to do ascetic practices. I don't need money. It will fall from the sky. I don't need friends because I am perfectly satisfied with myself. I can take care of myself. Even when I'm very ill, I don't need any help from anybody. Okay. That's a little bit dumb, isn't it? That's an ego trip, actually. Lama Yeshi, one of my teachers, when he saw people going to that state of mind, he said, you know, who do you think you are, Melarepa? Yeah. You have to function in society. So you need certain things. What are you going to do? Melarepa wore rags. Yeah. Are you going to go to your job in rags? Well, no, you won't have a job. Okay. Yeah. You're going to go sit on the streets of New York. Yeah. And be the, the renounced meditator on the streets of New York. Yeah. With your alms bowl. Right? Yeah. How long do you think you can hold that up? Yeah. I'm so renounced that I don't even need to pee and poo. Yeah. I'm just a renunciant. Good luck. <laughs> okay. So that's definitely an extreme, isn't it? Yeah. As monastics... We have a certain level of quote, quote, asceticism, yeah, that we voluntarily assume, not because we're on an ego trip, but because we know in our hearts we really don't want to do certain things. And we know in our hearts that if we do certain things, it really messes our mind up. We get attached, we get angry, afflictions really start to arise. So we stay away from certain things, yeah. But we eat, yeah, we have a bed, we turn on the heat, yeah. We live in eastern Washington, you better turn on the heat when it's winter, okay. So you have to be practical, yeah. And overcoming attachment is not a, it's not a thing of looking like a renunciant and playing at being an ascetic. Because you can look that way and go up to the mountains, find your cave, you know, where you're only eating nettles because you're going to be Milarepa. But when you're sitting there meditating, what are you thinking about? I hope all my friends in town 
know how ascetic I am and what a good meditator I am. I hope they appreciate how holy I am and bring up a big box of chocolate chip cookies to make offering to me because as a renunciant, I am an object of offering. Give me a break. Okay, that is not Dharma practice. Your mind's totally distracted, isn't it? You want reputation. Yeah, you're seeking offerings. Yeah, so that that's not the way to go. Okay. Because you want your cave, you know, with central heating, with air gone in the summer. Yeah, with a soft bed. Could you please talk about the relationship between sorrow and compassion? Okay, so sorrow is our response to misfortune and disagreeable situations. So we can feel sorrow at our own misfortune. Sometimes we feel sorrow when we look at other people's misfortune or we look at other people's actions and we know that they're digging themselves into a hole that is going to be full of suffering and there's not much we can do about it. Okay. So when we have sorrow for other living beings like this, that makes attachment, uh, compassion arise. Okay. Because we see, oh, it's through their confusion, through their ignorance, that instead of creating the causes for happiness, they're creating the causes for suffering. Yeah, that makes me sad. I have compassion. I want them to be free of that suffering. Okay? Sometimes the sorrow is for ourselves. You know, I'm sure Queen Elizabeth is experiencing a lot of sorrow now. Okay, grief is a form of sorrow. I think, and some people may dispute with me, I think that kind of, that grief is your, you had an image of what the future was going to be and your image is not going to happen. So you're grieving for what won't happen, not grieving for what you had. Yeah? And, uh, you know, offer yourself some kindness. Yeah? Understand what's going on in your mind, that you had a vision, you know, of how you wanted the future to be. And now circumstances have changed and that's not going to happen. Yeah. And then see that that can be something that revitalizes your life instead of being a loss that you get depressed about. Yeah. It can be something that challenges you. Okay. Like I was talking about how some people during COVID, yeah, faced enormous obstacles, but they found something that really gave meaning and joy to their lives despite that. Okay. And I told you the story this morning of this woman when her husband died, yeah, who said, I, I love you so much, but now I'm going to share that love with the world. Yeah. So this this is the way of thinking that that you can have if you give yourself space to think in a different way. And a lot of what we're doing in Buddhist practice and especially the mind training practice is we're learning to think in different ways. Yeah. Because how we think influences whether we were happy or miserable. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, 
I took half the session on the questions. We'll go back to the text. (laughs) But I think these questions are very important, you know, and they're related to people's life and how you can put the teachings into practice. So please don't just listen to them or don't just take notes on them. Go home and think about them and think about situations in your life. Okay, so we're going back to the three kinds of dukkha. Okay, so the third kind, the basis upon which these arise, the dukkha of uh, pain and the dukkha of change, the basis for them is the body and mind, the five aggregates subject to clinging. Because we have these five aggregates, all the other unsatisfactory situations arise. This is the pervasive dukkha of conditionality, which is intrinsic to the five aggregates that are clung to with ignorance. Hmm? So the five aggregates, okay, our body, feelings, discrimination, miscellaneous factors, and primary consciousnesses, Okay, all five of them are momentary processes bound together in relationships of mutual conditionality. So they affect each other. Okay, our our feelings affect our discriminations. They affect uh, the primary consciousness. They affect which miscellaneous mental factors arise. Our body influences all these things, okay? So these things are bound together and they affect each other. We, but despite this conditionality, this interdependence, we believe ourselves to be independent persons existing above and beyond the body and mind or existing within the body and mind and having control over them. So sometimes we think of ourselves, I am independent, I am above the body and mind, okay? Body can die, I still exist, okay? Or sometimes we feel like there's an I inside the body-mind conflict, you know, uh, uh, a comp- composite, and we think that that I controls the body and mind. Can you control your body and mind? Well, you can make your hand move. Can you prevent your body from getting old? Can you prevent it from getting sick? aside from taking care of yourself, yeah? Can you control your mind? Five minutes of meditation shows you you can't. It's hard to stay on one object, isn't it? Or it's hard to just even follow a train of thought. Okay, so this idea of being an independent self is delusion, okay? That kind of self doesn't exist. Until now, we have never examined how we grasp the self and simply assume there is a self that is in control of the aggregates. Yeah? We feel that way, don't we? I can control, yeah? I can control. I can control my mind when I meditate. I just haven't tried hard enough. Yeah? I can control my mind when I want to overeat. I just haven't felt like it. Yeah? I can control my mind and, you know, not be, uh, you know, not sleep so much. But, you know, why should I exert myself in that direction? Yeah? Now, I'm not telling you to go without sleep. Don't jump from this extreme to that extreme. (laughs) Okay. 
When we look deeply into the nature of the five aggregates, we see that they are simply momentarily changing processes that are in constant flux. That's all they are. There's no real personal me that exists in them, behind them, on top of them. Okay, the aggregates arise and pass away without interruption. And we cannot control that, them arising and passing away. Okay, we can do, control the causes that could make them arise and pass away in different ways. But we can't make things permanent. Anyway, if they were permanent, they couldn't function. And, you know, then everything's at a standstill. Okay. Though the aggregates arise and pass away without interruption, giving rise to the next moment in the same continuum, what we consider to be the person consists of only momentary material and mental aggregates. That's all that's there. I was once talking with a, a, one of my Dharma friends who's a very, very knowledgeable, yeah, in the Dharma. And he said, I don't like when it, when it says that the aggregates are just constantly changing processes without a person. You know, I want there to be a person there. Yeah? Because when you love somebody, you love some real person, we think, don't we? There's some real person. It's not just a body and a mind. There's something special that really is the person that's independent of the body and mind. Because the body, the, yeah, we know they're going to get old, that's okay. We know they're going to be moody, that's okay. But I really love them, some intrinsic core of them, who that person is, that is somehow mixed in with the body and mind. But when we search for it, we can't come up with it. We can't find it. But we feel it. We feel the essence of that person. We feel that we have a real essence. Here, there's really me. It's so kind of disappointing to find out that maybe there's not a real unique personality here. That there's just the body and mind that are always changing. And that the mind looks and designates I in dependence on that. And that's all the I is. That's so disappointing, isn't it? Yeah? You feel a sense of such loss. You know, because I've struggled so much. Who in the world is this I that struggled so much? I have so many good qualities. Who is that person that has so many good qualities? Okay, good thing to ask. Good thing to ask. Our bodies and minds are transient by nature. There is no further cause or external condition for their changing and passing away other than their having arisen. So once something arises, it's passing away. You don't need something else to come in and change it. By its very nature, it doesn't endure until the next moment. The Buddha said, whatever has the nature of arising 
All of it has the nature of ceasing. This is subtle impermanence, and to realize it clearly through direct experience requires great mindfulness and concentration. Yeah, we really have to be able to stay on something moment by moment to recognize its arising and ceasing in each moment. This realization is very valuable because when coupled with the understanding that our aggregates will never be something secure that we can take comfort in, it leads us to seek the origin of dukkha and to investigate if it can be eradicated, and if so, how. Okay? So it's by really seeing the impermanence of this body and mind, and therefore of the self, and that there is nothing there to hold on as you, this unique individual, okay, that I grasp onto, that's more special than any other individual who ever existed. Okay, don't you think that way about yourself? Yeah? I mean, who do you think about all day? Yeah? Who do you think about all day? Who do you worry about the most? Who's more important to you than anybody else? Me! Okay, so when we see that impermanence and we see that, you know, the aggregates are never going to be secure. The body is not going to last forever. Our mental states are not going to last forever. Yeah. Even when we get depressed, that isn't going to last forever. Even when we're grieving, that isn't going to last forever. Okay? So we come to then think, well, this whole state that we're in is really unsatisfactory. So what causes it and what can be done about it? So that's why true dukkha is explained first. Okay? Because we have to really understand this in order to have the oomph and the inspiration and the motivation in our mind to uh, abolish the cause of samsara. Yeah, because we can't just look at the cause of samsara and say, go away. That's not how it works, because the cause is in here. Okay. So repeatedly taking the five aggregates occurs due to ignorance, craving, and karma. So sometimes I say afflictions and karma, sometimes ignorance, sometimes craving, sometimes karma. It really refers to all of them. They're in cahoots. Not only are our present aggregates, our present body and mind, the product of past ignorance, craving, and karma, but they also become the basis in this life for the arising of more ignorance, craving, and karma, which lead us to taking another set of five aggregates subject to clinging in the future. And these aggregates, too, are under the control of ignorance, craving, and karma. So if you see that, you know, our, why are we born? Ignorance, craving, karma from previous life. Now we have this body in mind. Do we relate to our body with wisdom? No. We indulge our body or we torture our body. Okay. What about craving? We crave for pleasure of this body. We crave for mental pleasure. Okay. We get angry when we can't get what we want. We get angry when our, our mind is uncooperative with us, okay, or when our body is uncooperative. So what we have now was caused by previous ignorance, craving, and karma. 
But because we have this now, in relation to it, we generate more ignorance, we crave more for it, our present aggregates to be happy, to be safe, to endure forever. And we create more karma by acting, trying to make this body and mind perpetually happy, perpetually safe. Yeah. And doing that creates more cause to be born again in samsara due to ignorance, craving, and karma. Okay? So this is one of the faults. I mean, we're do- what His Holiness is doing here, what the Buddha is doing here, is a very in-depth analysis of exactly how samsara functions. Yeah, and to really think about that. In pointing to craving as the prime example of the origin of dukkha in the above passage, the Buddha was not disregarding the role of ignorance, other afflictions, and karma. Ignorance obscures the mind from knowing things as they are. And within that unclarity, craving is an active force that creates dukkha. Yeah, when we don't know reality as it is, when we grasp at things existing in a false manner, okay, then we crave things that are not worth craving. We want to have things that are are not going to bring us the lasting happiness that we want. Okay? So, it, you know... So this happens in several different ways, okay? How craving is an active force that creates more dukkha. So first, craving arises towards whatever is pleasurable. Well, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with pleasure. Repeat, there is nothing wrong with pleasure. What is the difficulty is the attachment to and the craving for pleasure. That's what brings the suffering, not the pleasure. Okay? So craving arises towards whatever is pleasurable. It seeks out objects, cognitive faculties, you know, our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body faculty, mental faculty, Okay, it seeks out contact with external objects or with thoughts. It seeks out feelings. Yeah, I, I hate being unhappy, but we tell ourselves to know real happiness, I must experience suffering too. That's baloney, by the way. Okay, but, you know, when we suffer... I feel alive. Yeah. So we seek, you know, we seek out things just to prove to ourselves that we are alive and that we feel. You know, that's what's happening. Some people cut themselves. Yeah, that's the dynamic that's happening there. We seek out intentions. We think we seek out certain kinds of thoughts. We seek out images that are agreeable. We seek out fantasies that make us feel good. Okay? We daydream. We create alternative realities and live in them. Yeah? The etern- you know, you see... What's the alternative reality? I actually won the election. I wonder if he actually sincerely believes that. I think he does. Yeah, something is wrong. You know, it's not just a lie. He sincerely believes that, counter to all evidence. Okay. Does this cause suffering? You bet. 
In short, craving makes us into addicts who perpetually seek more and better physical and mental pleasures. So that's our theme. More and better, more and better. I want more and better. Okay. And mental and physical pleasures. So think of what you do to get this mental and physical pleasure. Yeah. We really are like addicts chasing after it, aren't we? Yeah, I want reputation, I want praise, I will do anything you want me to do as long as you tell me I'm good. Okay. I want pleasure, yeah. My my drug is, I'm not addicted to it. Okay. Yeah, we all know nobody's addicted to drugs from their own perspective. And we all know that from their own perspective, nobody's an alcoholic, right? We just drink and we drug, but we're not addicted. We're not craving. Yeah? So mind your own business and don't tell me to stop. Hmm? It's only until we hit bottom that we realize, you know, we need to change. Okay? So causing us to cling to the objects that appear to give us pleasure, craving breeds dissatisfaction and a sense of lacking. Okay? I want the things that give me pleasure. Yeah, I can't have all of them. I get them, and then they're not as good as they were supposed to be. I get them, yeah, and then I lose them. So disappointment, disillusionment, okay? The bubble pops. We've all had that experience, haven't we? And yet, what do we do? We go back and we continue to sink more of that. Yeah. We're really like junkies in samsara. We go and seek more of what we had before that let us down, or more of what we couldn't get, thinking that this time, when we get it, this time, it will be different. So we're like, you know, the rats in the science experiments that keep tapping because once they got the rice grain and then they keep tapping, 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 hoping to get the rice grain. And maybe after a thousand taps, they get one rice grain. In the meantime, they're exhausted. But sometimes we're really like that. Yeah, I want happiness. I tried this, I tried this. This gave me happiness one time. Yeah, why isn't it giving me happiness again? I had a friend when I was uh, uh, younger in high school. Our families were, were friends, and he wanted a Porsche so badly. All I heard from him is, I want a Porsche, I want a Porsche, I want a Porsche. Yeah, he used to, we used to drive to Sunday school together, okay? And, you know, and so he was driving his parents' car. It was not a Porsche. It was some, I don't know what it was. I can't tell one kind of car from another. Yeah? But all he would do is talk about this Porsche. And if he had a Porsche, he would be happy. Well, years went by, and he was quite miserable. And finally, he got a Porsche. And he was happy for a short time. And then the Porsche didn't do it anymore. Yeah? So how often have we had that experience? Yeah? (laughs) 
thinking that gratifying all our desires will bring us happiness, we find ourselves immersed in cheating, lying, backbiting, and other harmful behaviors. We do this to get what we want, to destroy what's interfering with us getting what we want. In sum, craving lies behind much of the karma that projects rebirth in cyclic existence. Okay. In addition to motivating many of the destructive actions we engage in during our lives, craving arises forcefully at the time of death. Yeah, and it functions then to ripen the karmic seeds that will project us into the next rebirth. Okay, as death approaches, craving seeks to preserve our sense of being an independent person. Yeah, and being an independent person depends on having a body and mind. Being me, having an eye, depends on being a body and mind. Okay, so we don't want to separate from the body and mind in this life that are the basis for fabricating the idea of there being an independent self. However, during the death process, the body's ability to act as the support for consciousness ebbs, and craving gives rise to clinging. I crave to stay with this body and mind. I'm realizing I can't. What do I do? I grab for the next one. Okay, so clinging, which prepares the mind to seek rebirth in another body. According to the karmic seeds fertilized by craving and clinging, the mind con connects to another body at the moment of rebirth. For human rebirth, this is the moment of conception. When consciousness joins the fertilized egg, all five aggregates of the next rebirth come into existence together. The fertilized egg is the body, and along with the consciousness, some feeling, discrimination, and additional fat, uh, miscellaneous factors thus form the basis of the person of the new life. That's why they call it cyclic existence. Yeah? Yeah? You leave one, you get another. You leave one, you get another. Okay. Now, the true cessation of, of dukkha. We better get to that. We've had a whole day so far of dukkha. Yeah. We want, we want some good news now. Okay. So the true cessation of dukkha is the relinquishment of the afflictive obscurations, especially craving. So to really see that craving is the problem. It's not, the problem isn't not getting what we want. Craving is what makes us so miserable. Yeah. Okay, so removing the afflictive obscurations, especially craving, that's going to be the true cessation of dukkha. In our daily lives, we may experience facsimiles of cessation. For example, the peace and relief we feel when we let go of having our own way. When we let go of insisting on being right and having the last word in an argument. Okay? Those are moments of letting go of the craving. Yeah? And our, our misery stops then, yeah? When we are craving that I have to have my way. And sometimes we get like that, don't we? Yeah, I am determined. I don't care how you do this. I don't care what you think. My way is the right way, and I am dug into this. I am not going to do it any other way than this way. Okay? 
And then, of course, the other person saying, you know, they're reacting to that and saying, but, you know, listen to me, I have reasons for my view and maybe what you're thinking isn't so, you know, so straightforward and clear. And we don't want to hear from anybody else. Yeah, we're right and we're going to have that last word. And have you ever been in an argument with someone and known that you were wrong, but you keep arguing your point of view because you don't want to give up. Have you ever done that? No, never. <laughs> yeah. Other people do that. They're the unreasonable ones. They're the stubborn ones. But occasionally, maybe, we just say, I don't have to win this argument. Let's try doing this the other person's way. Maybe they have a better way of doing things than I do. Why don't I give it a chance? Okay. When you do that, then there's this like, oh, you know, because before your mind was so tight. Isn't it tight? Yeah, when you're being stubborn and you're right and you're going to win, the mind is like this. When you say, you know what? Maybe their way is just as good or even better. You know what? Maybe it'll make them happy if I just stop being so stubborn and you just put it down. Then there's a sense of relief in your own mind. You've, you've gone from this to like, okay, yeah, let's see what happens. Yeah. And sometimes when, you know, if you do that well, you can say even, I hope I'm wrong. Yeah? I was fighting for my way because I know it's the one right way. But actually, yeah, okay, let's try it this person's way. And, you know, maybe I'm wrong. And it really matters to this person to be able to try it their way. So, you know, maybe I am wrong and I hope I'm wrong and that's okay. Yeah? If I'm wrong, it's not the end of the world. Okay, you don't believe me. When other people are wrong and they give up their stubbornness, it's certainly not the end of the world. But me? Hmm. I am always right. Why? Because I'm me. I would never be wrong. Okay. So we uh, experience a facsimility of, of true cessations when we just put something down. You know, I think of my friend longing for his Porsche. What would have happened if he just said, doesn't matter, I can drive a VW bug instead? Yeah? And then he could see all the good qualities of, the, of a VW bug. You can find a parking space. And nobody will steal it. Nobody will steal it. Okay. So the Pali tradition speaks of four types of cessation, but not all of these are nirvana. So before going into those, let's pause, see if people have questions or comments they want to bring up. So to have uncontrived renunciation, does one have to have a realization of subtle impermanence? Because that's what it sounds like. You won't seek the origins. Until yeah. You have that. I don't think you actually have to have that full realization, but you have to have a good understanding of impermanence. So it says true cessation of dukkha is the relinquishment of the afflictive obscurations. Mm -hmm. So is 
the uh, relinquishment or the cognitive obscurations, is that a type of true cessation as well? Is that something just completely different? That the, the way we're speaking of the path in common with all the Buddhist traditions, and for everybody anyway, the afflictions are the source of dukkha, and true cessation or nirvana for everybody means uh, the cessation, the abandonment of the afflictive obscurations. Okay? The cognitive obscurations. Yeah, I suppose you would, you would cause when those are ceased, because those are ceased in different gradations also, you would call those maybe above and beyond true cessations, because you're already out of samsara. Okay. Yeah. But you do cease those other defilements as well. And you have a true, the path, which is still the wisdom realizing emptiness, but motivated by bodhicitta. And that enables you to cease those uh, obscurations. I'm curious how the state of mind differs between the mind that has realized subtle impermanence versus the mind that has realized emptiness. Oh, say that again, how the which person? The mind that has realized subtle impermanence yeah. versus the mind that has realized emptiness. Yeah. But for example, it seems for me that when one realized subtle impermanence, it would eliminate attachment because I don't know how one can be attached when one knows that it's impermanent. Yeah. yeah. What subtle the realization of subtle impermanence does is it helps us to, to give up the manifest aspect of attachment, but it doesn't cut the attachment at the root. Okay, so there's different kinds of antidotes that, you know, may suppress different afflictions, but only the wisdom realizing emptiness cuts them so that they can never arise again. And it doesn't cut them all at once, it cuts them in, state, in stages. Mm-hmm. So someone says, Venerable, I have goosebumps listening to this teaching about how clinging lies behind much of the karma that propels the next rebirth. What are the gradual ways to abandon clinging? To abandon? To abandon clinging. Singing. Clinging. clinging. To abandon gradual ways to abandon clinging. That's what I've been taught. <laughs> clinging, singing, <laughs> slinging. Yeah, what are you talking about? Just what I described before in terms of how to abandon attachment, how to lessen attachment. Think of impermanence, think of the disadvantages of impermanence, um, think of separating from the object. One thing that I, I often do from clinging is I imagine getting what I want in full 3D color. It's perfect. And, and I imagine that in my meditation. I don't go out and do it. I imagine it in my meditation. And then I sit there and I go, now am I 100% happy. <laughs> and I look at my mental state when I've imagined getting whatever it is I'm craving. And no, I'm not 100% happy. Actually, sometimes I'm anxious about losing what I have. Once I got it, I'm anxious about losing it because I'm attached to it. So that's a disadvantage yeah, to motivate us to, to not cling. And then another thing is look at what you're clinging and craving and ask yourself if it's really such hot stuff. Yeah, because so much of what we cling to and crave, if you really look at what it is, it's really not so wonderful that you have to make such a big deal about it that I can't live without this. Yeah. Have you ever uh, craved for something and not gotten it? And then realize the next day 
that you were okay without getting it? But at the time you were craving it, you felt like, I'm going to die if I don't get this? And actually you managed to live, and it was okay. Yeah? Remembering that kind of thing can give us the courage just to let go, too. Yeah? 